again because if someone says my badge says Ignacio, so <laughs> please bear that in mind. So shall we start now with a panel? This is a discussion that is becoming increasingly relevant in the agendas. This is about fair share. This panel is called update on the fair share discussions in the region and in the world. So it's not only about discussing these issues, they are as sending party pays or as cost sharing proposals. So I'd like to invite the members of the panel who will be joining us today. We have two remote participants, so I'd like to invite Fernando Borjón once again. I'm going to repeat this, but Fernando is Senior Advisor for Latin America of Axis Partnership. He was member of the board of the radio communications area of the ITU. He promoted the international communications in Mexico, who is a commissioner of the Federal Institute of Telecommunications in Mexico, and held several positions in the government and in multilateral organization. Then we have Rodney Taylor. Rodney is a secretary general of the Caribbean Telecommunications Union, the CTU. Prior to that, he held senior positions in the government of Barbados. He served as chief tech digital technology officer at the Ministry of Industry, Innovation, Science, and Technology. He was the head of Information Systems Unit at the Foreign Affairs Ministry. Then we have Basilio Rodriguez Pedos. He is a president of LAC ISP. He is a member of the board of ABRINT, which is the Brazilian Association of International Telecommunications Providers. Welcome, Basilio. He is founder and provider of one of the IXPs in Brazil. And remotely, we will have with us Alessandro Molon. Welcome, Alessandro. He is executive director of the Alliance for the Open Internet in Brazil. He is professor and a politician in Brazil of the Brazilian Socialist Party and a former leader of the opposition in the Chamber of Representatives. He was uh, drafted the rights of the internet in Brazil, which guarantees network neutrality, privacy, and freedom of expression. With us, we'll also have Alejandro Adamovich, who is a regional director of technology for Latin America at CEMA. Prior to joining GSMA, Alejandro was the marketing director at the Telefonica Group, CEO at Terra Argentina, as well as other positions in the industry. So let me join you over here. So as to introduce this topic, I already made a very brief introduction, but I'd like to ask Fernando Borjón to make a brief presentation that he prepared for us. Hello, good morning. Once again, I'm still here. That's no mistake. And this is another topic that we have, which is that of fair share and access partnership. Access partnership is based in London. We have offices in Washington as well as in Brussels. So this is a very important topic that has to do with connectivity, namely fair share, and how to develop these new networks. Before starting, let me explain that fair share is an old concept that has been recovering and gaining development through a discussion that is taking place in Europe. And why in Europe? Well, in Europe, it has been stated that by 2030, all the populations should have 5G coverage, that the homes, every single home has access to one gigabit per second 
in terms of speed. So those are the goals in terms of infrastructure. 75% of all companies should use cloud. the cloud. 80% of the people should be trained in digital issues. There is a very clear digital agenda. It's a public agenda that the European Commission has in Brussels in the sense of aiming at these goals. And as I say, the horses are now in front of the cart, as we say. So one of the elements that is being discussed is that concept of fair share. This is what the telecom operators have described, particularly at the ETNO, the European Telecommunications Network Organization and GSMA have are promoting this concept in order to have better access to the networks and to help to fund these networks. What is happening in Europe is that the operators has been a marked drop in the margin, so they're most concerned in the sense that they're not sure will they reach the goals for 2030, covering all cities with 5G. 5G hasn't achieved the expected penetration yet. They are not available in all the mobile phones that are available now for using this technology. So when we have developments, as I mentioned previously regarding private networks, this is not yet available. So the ethno looks into these concepts in these documents. This is, there are nine options. So the idea is to have a harmonized market in terms of the spectrum to decrease the barriers for implementing these networks. You will recall that Europe has been a market with very high prices in terms of spectrum, and these high spe prices have an impact on the operator and financial pressure. And there is a discussion as to who will want to invest in a network when that network won't have a high margin. So these are the discussions that are taking place. It is in that framework that this concept is being promoted, that the platforms pay for the service offered by the operators and to contribute to investments. We have to recall that the platforms are already contributing to investing in the networks, for example, in cloud, in data centers, in submarine cables. They are already there. Now, what they want now is to have a direct contribution to them. For example, what they call fair share or sender party pays. So the one who sends information has to pay. So this, this is one of the elements they're trying to obtain in order to have better funding. As a result of this discussion, in 2022 and in 2023, this topic was resumed. In 2023, a call was made by ETNO to the European Union to develop a fair share legislation to protect the digital future. GSMA sends out the same call, literally, word for word. The European Commission now is following this path with these deadlines or dates rather. On February 23rd, there was 2023, there was an exploratory consultation. On October 2023, the results of this consultation have been published. And now in February 2024, a new consultation is sent out with very interesting documents included in this presentation regarding a new network model. So this is a very vast document, but well worth reading and understanding. And in the context of this discussion of having a European digital agenda that seeks to obtain coverage in all the cities of a 5G network and speeds of one gigabit per second, this latest query is open until the 30th of June 2024. One of the scenarios, which is scenario number four, is being analyzed, and this could be might consider extending the regulatory framework for. Um, environment of rights and obligations equivalent to all the stakeholders and considering the economic impact of all the stakeholders. So you can access there and look at the consultation. In the case of GSMA Latin America, on February 19, 2024, there was a call for action to ensure the development of the internet and the digital future of Latin America and the Caribbean. 
these companies have signed the documents. More than 230 million Latin Americans and 22.8 million Caribbeans are still not connected. So that is why we are making a call. And now they point out that this is in line with other international agencies. <laughs> Me podrá decir Alejandro de, del uh, comunicado que hizo GSMA. So, the link that they give takes us to another declaration that we uh, said uh, initially that was developed in Europe, and Europe is not Latin America, nor is there a digital agenda in Latin America, nor do we have any targets of having 5G coverage in all the towns or, gigab or uh, gigabit connections uh, per second. The uh, environment is different. And uh, we, well, we published an article in, uh, with a colleague in Intermedia to analyze this item and as this could uh, have an impact on connectivity in Latin America. So this is a very vast discussion. I don't want to take any more of your time, Miguel, but thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Fernando. Uh, thank you for uh, all uh, the explanation. So now let's go on with the panel. I want to highlight something. If we wanted to have some time for questions, we should be as brief as possible. Uh, we have about, uh, well, you uh, just uh, use the time. If the audience has any questions or comments, please leave it in the Q&A uh, panel uh, uh, Zoom, in Zoom. And if those of you present uh, want to do the same, well, do it too, so that we can take it into account for future activities or sessions. Alejandro Adamovitz, how are you? What, uh, why is it that the SMA uh, uh, members published this uh, letter in February, the call for action to ensure the development of Internet and the future, digital future of Latin America and the Caribbean? Well, to give you the context, uh, there's a lot of echo. I'm sorry, I can't uh, speak like this. I hear myself. I hear the echo. That bothers me. I think they're trying to solve that. Okay, now I'm going to try and take my uh, earphones out. So, to explain the reasons, yes, uh, um, Fernando already mentioned the public letter. Uh, I'd like to speak of uh, the operator's business challenges. What happens with uh, the operators in the current settings? of supply and demand in a hyper-regulated sector as the mobile sector. The operators face a growth of traffic that in Latin America is 23% as an average annually. In more developed countries, it's a bit lower. It's around 15 to 18. With a pressure on the capex, so this demand uh, of a bandwidth that presses the capex to preserve the quality of service. Remember that the operators are adapting the quality of service. So, so then that takes the capex of 18% over uh, revenues with, uh, prof with demands that may be in the best case uh, scenario in 30 and 18 is in capex. And, and on top of that, you have to pay taxes and so the situation of the operators, the financial situation of operators is rather complex. The revenues are stagnant in real. Uh, they grow by just one or two percent. It's an industry that receives one trillion dollars annually and they pay 560 billion uh, in uh, taxes. 
and uh, without and not counting the spectrum, for instance. So the situation is rather complicated from a financial standpoint. Fernando also mentioned the goals, the targets in Europe, the uh, one gigabit for everyone, and that. Speaking of money, is a 174 billion euro gap of investment to attain those targets. So th this request is not whimsical, nor is it an ambition of the operators. We are just thinking of how we are going to meet our targets and uh, continue to provide the service in a context where the traffic grows by 23% in Latin America and it will and going from 7 gigabit uh, in uh, to uh, 33 uh, in uh, um and by the year 2030 and most of it is in video and 80% of uh, the traffic are used by six platforms that are highly concentrated technological platforms that are regulated and they have a market capitalization that is remarkable nothing to do with well of course it's a, a different sort of business so if we want to if the operators <coughs> if the policy makers want to preserve the quality of service and to close the use gap in Latin America today is around 30%. When the connectivity gap is only 4%, that is 4% of the people are not connected, clearly the coverage effort is made. Uh, what's missing is the possibility to maintain, uh, to, to keep meeting those demands of this new model that has changed in the last uh, 10, 12, 15 years. Well, we started seeing an expl boom of videos in uh, 2008, 2009, and we continued to regulate the interactions of the players as in 1999. This is just not possible. And that is why the operators, where we in Latin America, but also in Europe, people think the same. We have a call for action for a fair share. It's just that those that are using the network should have, should contribute either among private, uh, of course, not harming by no means, because I know that this is a criticism to operators, but by no means uh, do we mean to discriminate either by type of uh, traffic or type of actor, but it's just that the greater uh, traffic generators and providers should uh, contribute in the development of the network. That is basically the thing. That is what we mean by the fair share, um, the GCMA. And the European Union is also debating this. In Latin America, there is a public uh, a consultation by Anatel in Brazil and other countries, they are also starting the debate. So these are the reasons why the operators want to keep this discussion alive. It's because we want a fair contribution for the benefit of all of other, for the sake of the communities. Thank you, Alejandro. All right, let's continue with Alexandro now. Alexandro, from the Alliance for the Open Internet, is closely monitoring what's happening in Brazil. Could you please tell me how these discussions started in the current uh, status? Of course, uh, Miguel, I would like, first of all, I would like to greet all the participants at the event. I would like to thank you for the honor uh, for inviting me to participate in such an important debate. I hope you can hear me well, and I apologize because uh, I need uh, 
interpretation because I'm speaking Portuguese and not Spanish as most of uh, the audience. I'm trying to improve my Spanish, but I think that it is better not to risk um, um, my performance at this event. So I trust uh, that you'll use uh, the interpretation. And I want to thank the interpreters that uh, connect us uh, these events. So I feel honored uh, to participate uh, representing the Alliance for the Open uh, Internet when as we are discussing the network rates. As a matter of fact, our association that unites the voices to defend neutrality in the network has closely monitored what's happening in Brazil and around the world on this issue. This alliance was created in December last year, with, and what we want to do is to contribute uh, with that discussion and to explain why it is that the uh, n network rates should not be the path to follow in Brazil or Latin America. In Brazil, we, the, the discussions around this topic became stronger uh, in March 2023. And after the explored the probing of the European Union in February that was uh, mentioned by the first speaker and also of the Mobile World Congress when the large operators presented their position for an additional remuneration for the use of the Internet infrastructure. From uh, March and June 2023, the Brazilian regulatory agency Anatel conducted a public uh, survey in NCI to um, see um, to discuss uh, the duties of users. In this consultation, they were asking about the adoption of models of network rates. In October, Anatel presented the results of that probe, and they announced in a new round of uh, subsidies. And as it was clear, of these 627 contributions that were presented in the first uh, 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 grant uh, 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 distribution, there was we saw a very strong rejection for that in Brazil. The president of Anatel recognizes the importance of the debate, and he pointed out that the operators have not yet presented evidence or proposals or concrete proposals on the need of uh, having that rate. In the same week of the presentation of Anatel, the European Commission dis uh, disclosed the results of their uh, probe, and it was very clear that uh, there were hundreds of players who were convinced about the negative uh, effect of the creation of a uh, network rate. In December 2023, the, uh, our alliance was created. This is a movement for the defense of uh, open, um, uh, open, free, and neutral network in Brazil, internet in Brazil to um, discuss uh, with, uh, to have a dialogue with other stakeholders. Today, we have more than 25 associations of companies that uh, engage, uh, that participate in our alliance in, in uh, digital education, uh, digital health, finances, uh, information, culture, and uh, 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 small and medium-sized internet providers today. In Brazil, the discussion is concentrated in the second public uh, probe of Anatel on the duties of users. The uh, 26 uh, subsidy that uh, is completed on the 15th of May. As I mentioned, Anatel had already conducted uh, a survey in 2023, but they didn't find enough data to identify a real problem or to justify interventions, including the network um, rates to extend the debate and collect data on the Brazilian market and to evaluate whether indeed there are any problems to solve. In January 2024, Anatel opened the second round of uh, 
uh, consultations. Our Alliance for the Open Internet is uh, preparing the contribution uh, for the users, including uh, based on economic studies. Anatel has led the discussions in the Ministry of Communications in Brazil, is accompanying this process. There are still no concrete proposals by the ministry, but recently the Ministry of Communications in Brazil, Joselino Filho, expressly stated that they were against uh, the fair share. Thank you, Alejandro, for updating us. In the Caribbean, too, we see some discussions. There's a group of operators that they call themselves uh, C9 and CTU, the organization that Rodney, the Secretary General of. So uh, the question to Rodney is whether you could give us an update on these discussions that are taking place in the Caribbean. Thank you very much, Nacho. Good morning, everyone. And um, thank you for the invitation to bring a perspective from the Caribbean. Um, the CTU represents 20 member states. We're an intergovernmental organization. Um, there is another organization by the name of Canto, which is a, a, um, an association of network operators within the Caribbean. And they have formed a group um, called C9 to address this issue as a group of operators in the region. Um, it is an issue that they've consistently over the years raised as a problem uh, as impacting their ability to invest uh, in network expansion, um, in particular in small states because of the high cost of this infrastructure, the subsea cables that connect us and so on. And so coming out of uh, discussions or negotiations in 2022, which focused on the elimination of roaming charges within CARICOM, within a single ICT space of CARICOM, um, prior to that, those discussions, the, um, there were significant costs to roaming within CARICOM from one country to the next. And so coming out of those negotiations, uh, an agreement was struck to uh, eliminate, well, not quite eliminate, but drastically reduce roaming, and, uh, which would lead to greater predictability in pricing and so on. But the also, operators also asked us to facilitate discussions between the big tech companies uh, coming out of a technical conference in the Bahamas in September 2022 that the CTU would facilitate discussions between uh, some of these big tech companies, about six of them, and the group of C9. And so we commenced our discussions in February last year um, and the first meeting. Coming out of that, we agreed that we would, uh, over a period of three months, try to um, advance the issue and come up with some policy recommendations for our policymakers and regulators in the region. Uh, I should say that generally there isn't a con there hasn't been a consensus within our member states with respect to um, if in fact this is a problem and if uh, regulatory intervention is needed. But the the discussions started in February focus on three major work streams. One, um, looking at this issue from a business perspective or commercial point of view. So if in fact we are talking about network contribution or network usage fees, how would that be calculated based on what um, and what, what guidelines or regulations would there be around how these funds can be used uh, to ensure, for example, that they were used towards network expansion. Um, and also, the uh, work stream two focused on technical solutions, um, the deployment of CDNs, uh, content delivery networks, um, traffic congestion mitigation measures. Um, that, in fact, was led by Mr. Brent McIntosh, who's a part of Caribnog uh, and a, a senior expert within, within CARICOM. The third work stream also focused on uh, regulatory intervention. So if in fact it came to regulations, what possible regulations could work within the Caribbean? Um, there was no consensus on any of these work groups. Um, <laughs> the operators felt that this is not a, an issue that required technical, a technical solution. Um, they were very adamant that uh, it is really a question of making a contribution to the network, especially for the access networks, and in particular mobile networks. 
Um, whereas the, the OTTs did not want to speak about commercial arrangements or about regulatory intervention and wanted to focus solely on technical solutions. So coming out of that, um, we reached no consensus. <laughs> uh, we did come up with a, with a resolution that was tabled, um, summarizing our discussions um, and tabled a resolution that was accepted by our executive council in Barbados last year um, with a view to one, advancing the issue to the CARICOM heads of government for consideration and also the establishment of a formal group which would include uh, the Caribbean Competition Commission, uh, in particular because uh, the operators are saying that this is really effectively a market failure uh, because of their inability to invest um, and to address also the connectivity um, targets within the region. So uh, where we are now is that we are signing those recommendations to the heads of government and the intention is to continue discussions in a more formal way to include the Caribbean Competition Commission, the CTU and regional uh, regulators. So by no means have we settled the issue, but we are uh, have a committed to ongoing discussions to come up with recommendations. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Rodney. Eh, está bueno ver que... Thank you, Rodney. It's good to see that you are discussing things together. I don't know whether everyone together, there might be some of the players not participating, but we have to look at the reality of the Caribbean. But at least in this panel, we're trying to represent all the possible players. For example, LAC IXP, Basilio is for example, here as chairman of the internet providers of Latin America and the Caribbeans. So which would be the position of this player that is not always considered in these discussions, which is between major operators and major providers, and maybe small and medium players are not being considered. Thank you very much for your invitation to this panel to ask me to participate in the panel. Normally, we have a well-defined position regarding fair share to such an extent that we call it unfair share. It's something that is not fair. Now, this discussion on the need of the networks and the content of the networks causing an impact on the telecom networks is something that I've been hearing since the year 2012. This is nothing new. This is quite old, in fact. But as we heard previously, the world has changed a lot. Today we have all the CDNs. Today we have all the traffic exchange points. So the situation nowadays so that the contents are making pressure to use the networks is something that is not true. That's a false problem. At present, almost everyone uses the internet through a device such as these. It's a device such as these, like a mobile phone. But 85% of the time, you use these mobile phones, you're using a Wi-Fi network. So this means this is a fixed network. Only 15% of the time you use internet is with a mobile network out on the streets. So the large amount of the time is always using Wi-Fi and a fixed network that has fiber optics and other types of resources. So. In fact, there is no need of 5G having to transport the video streams. When you are watching a video on a mobile device, almost always, I would say 85% is through Wi-Fi. In Abrint, we spoke with Okla and with Cisco, and they told us that 85% of all the time someone is using a mobile device to do something in the internet, they are either using a Wi-Fi network or a fixed network. Only 15% is out on the streets. 
So the problem is not 5G. Internet is not only 5G. In Brazil, there are 20,000 small telecommunication enterprises. These 20,000 enterprises have 53% of all the fixed broadband traffic in Brazil, and almost all of them are fiber optics, fiber optics to the home, FTTH. So today, Internet has changed the entire content. It is on the border. It is no longer centralized. You no longer have to pay for a lot of traffic to reach content. Content is on the border, on the CDNs. The small providers have CDNs in their data centers, or they are connected to a traffic exchange point. I also have a provider in Brazil, and before I came here, I checked my graphs to check the use of the traffic exchange point and the internet. And we were at about 80% of traffic coming from traffic exchange point. So the streamings, the videos, your YouTubes and Netflix all come from traffic exchange points. They're not coming from the internet. 20% of the traffic of my provider came from outside, and which would require a better network. And because the last mile when you reach the client is through fiber optics, there's no pressure, there is no need for the networks to receive money from those who have the content. And the content and telecommunications always went hand in hand. They are partners, so there is no need to have 5G networks unless you have content. There's no need to have networks with a high capacity if you don't have content. And if we didn't have the contents we have today, we could have dial-up internet today, and nobody would be missing that. It would be the same. So. The two things go hand in hand. There are no high capacity networks. If there is no content, there's no content unless you have high capacity networks. Now, the point that they have in Europe, which has goals of having 5G in every device, is like Fernando was saying, quite different to the case of Latin America. In Latin America, if you charge for a network fee for contents that you have to pay to the telecoms, that money will not be used to provide connectivity in the Amazons or in rural areas which are far away. This will be used to put 5G in the big cities, and that is not fair. That is an expense that is charging money to make more money. So the issue of the lack of resources of the telecom companies. I would like to mention that this week the financial statements of all the telecom companies were published. They all had an increase in equity. This was published in the specialized media in Brazil. So we see that there is they don't have a need for having more money to have more 5G networks. The 5G networks are important, but Internet is not only about 5G or 6G. Internet is fixed broadband in the homes and Wi-Fi with a greater capacity. So you have other types of problems that we have to solve. And fair share might seem as if they have to figure out a problem, so a problem that does not exist using a wrong argument. Thank you, Basilia. Before asking the following question, I'd like to clarify something because I would like to refer that Peru did the efforts of having all the players here. It might have understood that this was not the case, but I'm aware that that certainly was the case. Fernando. In your experience as a government official and now as a consultant, what is your vision of fair share? Can you hear me? Sorry, I turned it off. 
I worked for 20 years for the Guard. I was commissioner of the Federal Communications Institute. I'm a consultant in the private initiative in Access Partnership. And in fact, Nacho, there was an opportunity, a very big opportunity to try to serve others in the public service. Now, I think that the concern of the regulators is listening to the GSMA points stating that, well, I need to have the capacity to build better networks, to have the capacity to overcome the digital divide. The margins are very hard. So there is an opening and there's a shared concern on the side of the regulators. And today in my role as a consultant, I also understand this. There is a strong pressure in order to manage companies, be attractive and to have attractive results in order to provide and obtain loans for building networks. So if growth is expected to be achieved, as we said in the previous presentation, well, if more traffic is expected, then everyone is envisaging a big wave in artificial intelligence. This might lead to having a greater capacity in networks. So as we heard from Brazil, much will be solved through the fixed networks, but a lot of growth is expected in the mobile networks. In Europe, there's a strong presence, pressure for having 5G everywhere. And in Latin America, at least we have to figure out a solution to the digital divide. What we see is that that pressure is not the single um, a single uh, solution. There are several elements that we needed to study to find solutions that won't have a negative impact on the network. Here we say, well, let's charge the large traffic contributors a certain tax or a certain fiscal uh, uh, tax to, the, to then use it to develop networks. So what happened? with uh, the neutrality issue. I think that that is a key element that needs to be preserved. And we need to avoid any networks having m more privileges than others. So how can there be other solutions? Well, governments can look for issues such as uh, the big elephant that is uh, we agree with Alejandro in terms of the discussions in the mobile part, the price of the spectrum. The price of the spectrum paid in Latin America is very high. In Mexico, it's the fourth, uh, uh, Alejandro, uh, it's the fourth most expensive rates in uh, the world. And that led uh, to the uh, uh, the fact that Telefonica had to leave the market as an operator. And now they are just, uh, they depend on AT&T AT and, and not even like that do lawmakers want to change the uh, scheme of uh, the use of the spectrum because uh, it's a cow they are milking every year and they pay an annual a price. The price of the spectrum is a, a very important thing and we need to solve. It's something where the government has all the tools to say how to move forward, facilitate access, guarantee security. The radio base uh, role of the people, they say, they want to uh, they want, for instance, people want to steal the copper in the fiber optic, and they don't even know that there's no co copper in the fiber optic. So these are issues that need to be approached. I think that there's a whole uh, uh, setting that we can guarantee, and I think that as a public servant, you have the tools, the price of the spectrum, security, promoting the use of networks, not making that as the only contributing in the fiscal part. I think that those are very important elements as alternatives to generate a better capitalization to uh, have better networks. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando. We go back to Alejandro. The voices in favor of fair share put uh, South Korea as a success case. What are the grounds for that? <coughs> well, again, since we are speaking of South uh, Korea, let me give you the context. In the case of Korea, indeed, for us, they are pioneers in the approach uh, of this unbalance uh, of the data traffic. 
uh, be, uh, due to the action of large traffic providers, uh, traffic uh, users. Uh, South Korea is one of the leading countries in connectivity. They are leaders in all the indicators almost. They were pioneers in the introduction of commercial 5G in 2018 in the adoption of a rural fiber optic, they're about 90%. 50% of the population already have 5G connectivity. The coverage of the population is about 25%. Well, it helps that the country is relatively small, of course. What happened in South Korea was that as a result of discussions among some of the contents providers and the operators, Essentially, there's a case that is South Korean uh, telecom with Netflix. They had a dispute, basically, on a fair share. The operators were requesting a fair share because the regulator uh, intervened and well, in 2018, they established a model for a compensation that is only uh, applied in some cases where there's unbalance of the traffic. That is, if the, the traffic delivered uh, over the traffic received is less than 1.8. So clearly, it focuses the problem in large traffic generators. It would not apply to small companies. It wouldn't be harm the small companies that certainly, according to that uh, interpretation, might be uh, harmed. But uh, so the uh, key partners uh, are those uh, the ones that pay in South Korea. So the in-connection uh, scheme also applies well, to the ISPs. What this proposal searches is, seeks is to establish a balance and uh, equal uh, conditions for uh, uh, traffic providers because internet is that, it's traffic. What happened with this? Well, in terms of uh, traffic of mobile data, in spite of the fact that they said that it would discourage uh, the demand, traffic has grown by 34.5% in the last five years annually, even more than in Latin America. So it clearly didn't have a negative impact on demand. What One of the providers that I mentioned earlier adopted a measure that was to take uh, the distribution of contents to Japan uh, because they don't want this fair share and this was a friendly res uh, resolution among the two and in August 2023 they reached an agreement between the two companies and they reached uh, a friendly agreement to have a contribution by the contents provider and the operator. So obviously, it is true that it's a, a difficult discussion for each of the parties, but finally, based on a decision of the regulator, that somehow they stated that the parties should sit down and negotiate. So that's a position of the SMA, GSMA that uh, we we need uh, free uh, <coughs> decisions and not uh, having to pay uh, rates for the use of the internet so what what happens now is that a country like south korea continues to be the leader and the and they continue to be the pioneers in this case of trying to find a solution to the uh, to this uh, discussion thank you alejandro Alessandro, what, what is the position of the alliance in that respect, and what is the scenario in the future for Brazil? Well, we, we clearly are against charging any, any rates or fees. The nomenclature itself, and shows how we see that uh, 
the, those rates. Well, um, the fact that we use uh, um, rates uh, for the internet is not just for the lack of audience justifying it, but also because of the evidence of the s serious risks that it entails for the internet in Brazil and around the world, as we are going to uh, clearly and respectfully state that in the contribution on the rights of the users, the uh, uh, internet rates are not a, a path that Latin America should follow. They lack justification. In spite of the discord of some large operators, there's no evidence of a, of a boom of a data traffic. Demand is uh, steadily growing, and it is consistent with the increase in the infrastructure. The st study of uh, the economist Chaco Brado that will be presented by our association, uh, subsidies of Anatel, uh, describes uh, that uh, a uh, sustained increase of the use of data, both fixed and mobile, in future years with uh, an increase in the revenues of the telecom sector. And even the sector of telecom, the telecom sector is repeatedly presenting very positive results in Brazil and I think that uh, across the region. The results of the last quarter that were disclosed recently emphasize that fact. For instance, Tim, that is the Italian telecom in Brazil, they had revenues for 6 billion reales in the first quarter. So it increased by 7.3%. Claro had revenues for 11.7 billion, that is, it grew by 5.4 percent with regard uh, versus the previous term, and uh, in 2023, all year, we evolved the tel uh, telecom company in Brazil had 52 billion reales. That was the revenue uh, that increased by 1.4 percent. The uh, our uh, net income was uh, grew by 23 percent versus 2022, and the EBITDA was 21 billion. That is 10.6 uh, uh, percent increase. It's not by chance that the CEO Anes Paletti. Um, how to classify the performance of the company in Brazil as uh, the star and exceptional. That is, not only didn't the telecom companies uh, show an evidence of uh, having a, a rate uh, for the networks uh, in, in Brazil, and the evidence points to the lack of a need to have uh, such rates uh, in view of uh, the uh, increase um, uh, profit of these companies that contribute to distribute, continue to distribute dividends and have been, uh, this has been uh, uh, described by uh, the journalists in Brazil because they pay excellent dividends every year. And if a uh, fair share uh, uh, duty were added for the first services. There are no clear, uh, just there are no justifications. But on the other hand, we have the severe risks for the digital ecosystem that this would bring about. Even for the telecom companies themselves that benefit with uh, more. Our clients that are ready to pay to have access to online services and services, as Basilio pointed out in this panel earlier, these are services uh, that feed each other, providing services one 
um, puts the content in the networks, uh, incentivating the growth of telecom companies that, in turn, are necessary for consuming those internet services. And if that is, is should not be seen as competition, but a good uh, collaboration between the parties, the network uh, 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 rates are like charging twice to end users because we know that in the streaming services they end up uh, coming uh, being paid from uh, the consumer's uh, pocket. They damage the neutrality of the networks and competition, concentrate uh, the market, uh, and uh, they do not consider Anatel or, or and uh, the millions of small providers in addition to ignoring the virtuous cycle of the internet. And uh, it's part of uh, the... so. It uh, prevents uh, investment in CDNs and data centers and uh, submarine cables for the sustainability and efficiency of the network. From the uh, its creation, our alliance wants a dialogue among the different stakeholders, technical communities, civil society, the government, uh, Congress, and the private sector, and uh, a key uh, and an evidence-based based, uh, dialogue and. Uh, uh, positions based on data. For example, we requested conducting economic studies to contribute to the public consultation of Anatel on the rights of users. And the scenario that we have for the future in Brazil is to have an open and quality internet for all without additional costs as a result of using the network infrastructure. Thank you very much for participating in this very important debate. And we continue with the spirit of cooperation that is in the DNA in the Alliance for Open Internet and to contribute positively to the discussions and to reinforce the path towards the digital transformation of Latin America with digital inclusions and in a free, open and quality internet for all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alessandra. I'd like to apologize in advance to Rodney and Basilia because we're really running short of time. Each of you has a minute and a half. You are the last to take the floor, but you have less time. Rodney, super fast. How do you see the future of these discussions in the Internet in the Caribbean? I'm not sure, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, we will continue negotiations. We believe that there is need for stronger evidence with respect to market failure. Uh, we do not, um, you cited the example of South Korea. We don't want a situation where we're encouraging CDNs and IXPs in the region. We don't want uh, that content to be hosted outside of the country, uh, as in the case of South Korea. So we don't believe that that's a viable solution. Uh, and therefore, we will continue to negotiate in good faith and hopefully um, come up with a solution. But as I mentioned, uh, there are two very distinct sides on this issue right now. The, po the policy makers are not in agreement uh, that there should be regulatory intervention. Thank you. Thank you, Rodney. Basilio, the same for you. How do you view the small and medium-sized internet providers f in the future? I will be very brief. The example of South Korea is an example of why fair share should not be made. This is because over there, a company signed an agreement with another company to use the content. In Brazil, you have 20,000 companies. You don't sign agreements with 20,000 enterprises. That's impossible. And in South Korea, we have heard news that much of the content was sent to Japan or to Singapore, so they left the country. That's bad for the Internet. Now, the big problem we have is what Alessandro Molon mentioned. The whole issue is the lack of neutrality of the networks. We're not against 
having the network companies paying some kind of tax or participate in some kind of universal fund, but not signing agreements between companies because that is what should not be done. This has to be something that does not affect network, uh, network neutrality at all. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you for joining us today. If you have today, if you have any questions, please include this in the Q and A box. We'll take that into account. And because so much interest in this topic, we will be continuing with this topic. Thank you very much, and a big round of applause for all the members of the panel. And let's take a picture then of all together. Alessandro y Alex. Alessandro and Alejandro, please stay on the screen so we can take a picture with you there.